in here. I'm glad to be Thank you all very much for coming. You're at the Whitmire Tech Entrepreneur Meetup. Uh, that's where you're intended to be. Um, we uh, do this meetup on the third Tuesday of every month. Uh, we bring in um, a tech and business speaker. This is our first topic on aquaculture. We're very excited for it. Um, but yeah, third Tuesday of the month, we're just trying to facilitate uh, technological conversations in the lower Fairfield County area. Um, one other announcement, um, which I can, I'm going to touch on at the end of the night as well. Um, some of you may have heard of our uh, take, uh, kind of an incubator program, the Invent Lab. Um, we have two offices in the back where we bring in a startup and help them with their patent and trademark work uh, free of charge and we do have a spot open right now so if you're interested in that um, you can talk to myself you can talk to mike cosma in the back um, but uh, but yeah we don't take any equity and we just um, and yeah, we just help companies build up their ip uh, portfolio so tonight's speaker is dr yarish and um, so as i said this is our first meetup on aquaculture and the response has been really great. Um, I know a few of you I've talked to have a, a broad interest in this topic. Um, Dr. Yarish runs the Seaweed Marine Biotechnology Labs at UConn. It has a uh, global reputation in the area of seaweed research. In addition to many federal grants, Dr. Yarish collaborates with organizations including the Woods Hole Oceo, Oce 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 Oceanographic Oce Institution. Thank you both the Marine Biology Laboratory, Cornell University, the U.S. Department of Energy, and many others. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Yarsh. Thank you, Ben. Well, what I'd like to uh, introduce you to is my passion, uh, which has to do with seaweeds. And uh, this uh, passion started many, many years ago when I was a young lad, lad growing up. Uh, on the shores of Jamaica Bay in New York. I got fascinated by uh, the marine life there and then ultimately uh, ended up taking a course in marine botany up at uh, Dalhousie University and got really uh, changed my life at that particular time. And from that time uh, on, I've devoted my uh, life to the understanding of seaweeds. Uh, some esoteric areas, other areas that are basically taking some of that area from the ivory tower, some of the research, and making it uh, worth the uh, opportunities for application. And what I'd like to do today is show you uh, one of our Pride's uh, products that have come out of our Yukon uh, research labs. And so, when we talk about seaweeds, uh, I think when I'm dealing with an audience, you have to understand uh, seaweeds are big things. They live in the marine environment there, and they come in three different colors, red, brown, and green. Uh, the green ones you don't want to see on your, on your local beach, but they have value uh, if you grow them in a farming environment. Uh, just like that green one that's pictured uh, on the uh, lower left-hand corner, that's called sea lettuce, and it's an ingredient now in many different foods. Uh, there are two red seaweeds uh, in the center, uh, one that is a sheet. Uh, you may know that if you've gone into Costco or Trader Joe's or if you've ever gone to a Japanese restaurant, uh, it's known as uh, nori, and uh, nori is the wrapping on your sushi and there are many nori products there. It's the most valuable of the uh, red uh, seaweeds there. Uh, the seaweed next to it uh, that is uh, red is known as Irish moss. Uh, people who have grown up uh, in uh, Northern Europe know Irish moss because you can make a nice pudding, long bonge with it because it's an extract that comes from the Irish moss known as carrageenan. And then we have the brown seaweed. And the brown seaweed includes the largest of any of the seaweeds in the marine environment. They include the kelp. Uh, some of you may have gone out to the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California, and you see the giant kelp there. Giant kelp can be over 270 feet in length. They can grow almost two-thirds of a meter on, uh, per day. 
they grow rapidly. They're very important. Uh, they are the structure of nearshore forests, and they harbor a lot of marine life. Uh, the uh, brown seaweed that you see there is our local kelp. It's called the sugar kelp. And from the sugar kelp, we've developed an entire industry uh, in the United States uh, in the last decade, and I'll introduce you uh, to that. So when we take a look at seaweed production, I think it's always important for people to realize it's a mature industry. It's an industry uh, that has, uh, it's producing today entirely by farming techniques, 30 million metric tons. That's a lot. 25% of global seafood production that comes from seaweed. Economic value is not as great as, say, fin fish aquaculture, but still, about 25% global aquaculture, the value is also coming from seaweeds there. And there are different seaweeds, like I said before, green, red, and brown. Uh, this the picture there shows a couple of brown seaweeds on Daria. If you've gone to an Asian restaurant, you may have had seaweeds, miso soup. That's made from uh, Daria, wakami is uh, a Japanese name. Saccharina is the uh, seaweed that if you go into uh, uh, Asian restaurants there, it's known as kombu. But right now, uh, the fastest growing part of this whole equation is what is taking place in North America and Northern Europe, which is an increase in the farming of seaweeds that are endemic to uh, the uh, North Atlantic uh, region. So what I'd like to do is let you know, here are some of the uses of seaweeds. If you look at different products, and if you look at products dealing with foods, uh, seaweeds are in a lot of foods. They're ingredients. I just spent uh, a day working with FDA because FDA is really at a loss uh, trying to understand uh, the food that are coming from different types of seaweeds, yet they have the regulatory responsibility of looking at what's in the ingredients coming from uh, seaweeds that are being imported into the U.S. And we, we spent a lot of time We're looking at feeds. Uh, different seaweeds are used as feeds in Northern Europe. Also in Australia and New Zealand, animals have been grazing seaweeds for centuries. Well, we know today about 18 to 20 percent of our greenhouse gases are coming from an animal that we all like. That's called a cow. Well, uh, the seaweeds that uh, are out there, some of the seaweeds uh, that cows graze on, actually cut down methane gas production. And that's the hottest area today in animal feeds. Companies like Carbile, DuPont, they're interested in trying to figure out, you know, how can you get these new seaweeds into uh, the food chain of these animals to cut down uh, the greenhouse gases. Uh, medicine, a lot of opportunities that are showing up right now. Uh, Bioreactive compounds are found in seaweeds, especially, especially tropical seaweeds. Why tropical seaweeds? In the tropical environment, there's a lot of grazing. One animal feeds on uh, other organisms, easy to feed on seaweed. They can't move away. So what do seaweeds involve? Mechanisms that cut down animals from eating them. Those anti-herbivore compounds are very important in biomedical areas right now. That's sort of some of the futuristic work. If you're looking at anti-tumor, anti-carcinogenic compounds there, uh, they're coming from seaweeds that are found in tropical regions. Cosmetics, you buy cosmetics from any of the cosmetic manufacturers, they're gonna be, they're gonna be including kelp in that because uh, the, the kelp have very important restorative compounds there that are uh, been uh, used in the cosmetics industry. Textiles have been using seaweeds for a long period of time. Uh, in part, uh, seaweeds are major sources of chemicals called colloids. And uh, sometimes they're called hydrocolloids, sometimes called phycocolloids, uh, alginates. 
uh, carrageenans and augers. Uh, these are colloids that have been used for more than a century in uh, our industries. Uh, they gel liquids. Uh, they stabilize fabrics so the colors don't run. And they're in a lot of the different food compounds that you are using. Uh, whether it's in the morning when you wake up and brush your teeth, uh, you like to have some ice cream, uh, the, uh, the carrageenans actually reduce uh, ice crystal formation. Uh, Arters are at the basis of our biotech industry. Uh, grow a lot of microorganisms from on auger services. Very, very important. The, the advances in DNA couldn't have been made without the auger as a service for doing different uh, activities of biotechnology. And uh, so these are some of the different uses. And in the future, you're going to see more and more about biofuels. And I'll say something about that later. So when we look at uh, these products here, these are some of the products you'll be able to see in the marketplace today. Uh, Atlantic Sea Farms used to be called a company, Ocean Approved. I helped develop that company uh, in the uh, Portland area. Uh, they were the very first seaweed company growing kelp in North America. And from that company, they morphed into a much larger company, Atlantic Sea Farms there. We showed them how to farm. I dealt with uh, one person who uh, was from the veterinary diagnostic industry, another person who was from the restaurant industry. They knew they wanted to do something in the sea. They developed a product from wild harvesting, some seaweeds from the Gulf of Maine. And then they realized that if I grow this company, we could destroy the environment. And so they came to me and we then embarked on a long-term relationship where we showed them how to farm. And they've done very, very well. Uh, and Bain Coast Sea Vegetables up in the uh, upper left-hand uh, corner, uh, every GNC in the country has uh, their products, uh, which are principally wild harvested, even though today they're moving to farm products. And these are all edible products that are derived here in uh, North America for the most part. Uh, and, you know, current food trends. People are interested in what they eat. And uh, when we take a look at uh, seaweed products there, uh, they're healthy for you. Uh, they're, they're sea vegetables. Uh, what are the first models that Ocean Approved or Atlantic Sea Farms had uh, developed was a model saying we had the virtuous vegetable, uh, which really was the case there. And when we take a look at these uh, food products, uh, they are rich in a lot of different uh, essential elements that we need in our diets there. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner, uh, penny pasta that is made up of uh, seaweed as well. It's an integral ingredient of that from a company called uh, Blue Evolution. Another company that I helped uh, a friend develop, started from scratch, and now they're a big player up in Alaska. So when we take a look at seaweeds there, give you an idea about what's in them. It's always important to know what's in them. I always tell people, also know where it comes from. And that is really important. Just because it shows up on your uh, grocery shelf doesn't mean it's always safe for you because even the regulatory agencies are not sure how to treat the material. Uh, but when we take a look at the, uh, the seaweeds, they are nutritious. Uh, they have many different functions there. Uh, thickeners, emulsifiers, anti-inflammants, antioxidants, antiviral, antifungal. They are derived from seaweeds. That's what's going on today in the biotech industry. And there are many companies uh, that are uh, out there uh, now uh, working on product development coming from uh, different types of seaweeds. So, what happened? Why are people now in North America doing any kind of farming? Uh, I asked that question when I was sitting on sabbatical leave in 2008. I said, how come we aren't doing that in the United States coastal waters? What's been the big hang-up? I realized that the big hang-up was 
Too many people were doing things in the ivory tower. Nobody was using something called social media. Nobody was using the internet at the level of showing people uh, products that introduces them to uh, new, th new ideas in farming. And so I embarked on a process where I took all the cultivation story on how to cultivate seaweeds uh, that I developed, other folks have developed, put them in easily readable manuals that were open source. And these open source manuals even got translated into Spanish, ended up in uh, throughout South America, and that was really the, the, the beginning of a U.S. farming industry, having open source manuals. In addition to manuals, I felt people don't like to read, so what do you do? You make videos. And you make videos short enough that you get people's attention. And we did that as well. And these are just some of the uh, products there. In the lower right-hand corner, uh, those are pictures of juvenile stages of kelp. And the uh, little kelp uh, plants there start from a juvenile spore that's very, very small. Eventually, the spores develop into male plants and female plants. That's what you see in front of you, called cometophytes. Uh, males release sperm in the water. Females produce eggs. Uh, they mate. And the female sends a sex attractant out there to get the sperm to find the female. Uh, they do that uh, in the city. And then what we've done, we've developed the mechanism of doing that in the laboratory, developing nurseries that we can produce our own seed. And eventually, you can get farm lines, as you see in the right hand corner. Now, if you want to, you know when you've hit the right tone when you get into the US media market. Uh, 60 Minutes came to me a few years ago and they said, you know, we've heard that you've been working on developing an industry. Uh, we heard it's restorative. We heard it's good for the environment. And for seven months, I worked with the executive producers and we put together, some of you may have seen it, a uh, 60 minute story on ocean farming. And it was a very positive story. Every time the executive producers would fact check, they actually uh, were surprised that everything I was telling them was true. And which was, I said, look, I'm not trying to pull a wool over your eyes. I'm just trying to show that we have opportunities in North America, especially in US coastal waters, that could be unique for a US industry. And we've done that. Uh, other products as well are out there. But you have a time. It's a 14, 15 minute uh, story uh, repeated several times on CBS uh, as well. So uh, in addition, you know, it's one thing you can do your science, one thing to put different products out there. You have to also continually worry about uh, issues like workforce development. Well, I came uh, together with a group of like-minded scientists who are interested in taking uh, science, making it to application, and trying to figure out how to develop workforce development. Then we put together uh, courses uh, that built upon the ones that I initially laid out in 2008, 2009, 2010. And uh, it's working with the Algae Foundation. Uh, and we have these online courses there, uh, which will introduce people to different aspects of seaweed farming. And so, how does that relate to where you are today in Long Island Sound? Uh, virtually all the work that I've done started in my labs here in Stanford, Connecticut, believe it or not, that's kept secret. I also had another lab in Groton, Connecticut, our marine station, but I had three uh, farms. I had one farm in the East River. Uh, we were the only, and we were the very first farm uh, ever permitted in the uh, uh, city limits of New York, working with a good uh, group of uh, consultants, we were able to deal with the permitting nightmare for three years, and uh, we got a farm site right off Hunts Point, uh, the Bronx. And uh, that's where we did a lot of work on our different seaweeds that we were working with. Uh, we worked with seaweeds that were red. We worked with seaweeds that were brown. Uh, I'm only introducing you to uh, the browns today, but uh, reds are really good 
for this region because they like to grow in the summer, but then you have problems like uh, conflicts with your coastal zone. Uh, we had another uh, site right off Fairfield, uh, Jennings Beach is another site that we had, and then the third site out in Brampton in the Thimble Islands there, and uh, that site has been very interesting indeed. Uh, there's a lot of good shellfish aquaculture that is going on in these areas as well, except for the East River. Uh, so I'd like to introduce you to kelp. Uh, the kelp that we work with is one that uh, had its uh, name called the sugar kelp. Uh, colonists realized that it was sweet when they saw it in the late spring. Uh, that's how it got its name, sugar kelp. Uh, during the uh, late spring, uh, the uh, carbohydrate and sugar content is very, very high. This will be important later. Uh, it, it's a high quality food. It's got also alginates in it as well. And notice when it grows, it grows in the winter. What's out there in the winter? Not much. So when we're looking in the winter months to grow things, we want to cut down any of the conflicts and uh, it grows November to May. You put out microscopic material and that microscopic material in less than five or six months can be up to 24 feet in length. That's called growth. And that's what was found right off, also right off uh, the, uh, the islands here in Norwalk, the Norwalk Islands. We had an experimental farm there that was run by a friend of mine, Don Bloom, and his son uh, had a, a spot where we were able to do some of the kelp farming. And so we developed a lot of the techniques for kelp farming. Uh, we uh, developed the techniques in the laboratory where we can grow the seed, the germ plasm. There's no burpee seed companies for uh, seaweeds, so we started developing the germ plasm collection for that, uh, for North America, and we're able to grow male and female plants at our own uh, way, the way we want, grow it in the laboratory, uh, we're able to seed it onto a uh, line, uh, looks like kite thread, and put it on PVC tubes and then spool it off onto thicker line called long line, and you can see some of the production that we have. Matter of fact, that picture, May 2014, uh, that was a picture from our farm in the East River. So things can grow uh, virtually anywhere there. We've been able to uh, do that uh, and repeat it uh, throughout the whole New England area, Gulf of uh, Alaska, and uh, many other places. Uh, uh, during our first year or two, we are able to produce uh, quite a bit of kelp. That's a lot of tissue on a 100 meter long line. And uh, that was uh, exceeded our expectations, especially I was told, well, you guys are just starting in North America and you were able to get that. And this was done, was told to me by the Chinese. They were shocked that we were able to jumpstart things so quickly. They were working on something for, for 50 years before they got that number. And we just did use good old, good old American ingenuity. And so, you know, when you're farming uh, the seaweed and you're harvesting the seaweed, one thing you've got to keep in mind, seaweed, what's in them, reflects what's in the water. Now, in Long Island Sound, what are the things that, uh, that we have as you're going west in Long Island Sound, going towards the New York metro area, our waters increase in nitrogen. Uh, very significantly. That causes a problem in the summer months called hypoxia. It causes sometimes fish die-offs, sometimes harmful algal blooms, and lots of problems. But those nutrients are a resource. And when you're able to grow a seaweed that's able to use those nutrients there, you're taking those molecules away from problematic organisms. And in the meantime, as you harvest, you're taking those nutrients out of the water. We call this ecosystem services, or nutrient bioextraction of kelp. We quantified this. We opened up people's ideas. There are good benefits of growing kelp because it produces a large quantity, and a certain quantity is going to have nitrogen in it, 
a certain quantity will help phosphorus, and you're taking it out there. And by the way, you also are removing carbon dioxide uh, from the water. And this increases, then when you're doing that, uh, this increases the pH. One of the problems that we have with global climatic change is lowering of the pH of the water. It's ocean acidification. Not good for animals that have shells, uh, but for seaweeds, ocean acidification accelerates their growth. And this shows you on a production system what you're doing. So you're able to have some very important ecosystem services. I remember walking with somebody uh, on his beach in Greenwich. And he said, why should I let you, uh, you know, have uh, a farm system right off the Greenwich uh, coast? Why should I support that? I said, do you want to swim in certain types of seaweeds or dead fish? Well, you got a problem. You have too much nutrients. If you have, in, if you have shellfish farms and uh, seaweed farms in your area, they're extracting nutrients from the water. You extract the nutrients from the water, that's a benefit to you, and you're not paying for it. The farmer is making a living out of it. And so this is part of a social license uh, that you have when you're growing seaweeds. You're doing good for the environment. Some people like to call it restorative aquaculture uh, for the areas. And we're seeing more and more studies being produced on a daily basis now, bearing out what we've discovered in Long Island Sound. And so ecosystem services are important there. Uh, rest layer is a red seaweed that we work with. But also, when you have seaweed like the kelp, the saccharida, in the water, that also is an attractor for fish. And so you have the, a transient community developing in that area as well. And these are all important. It got so important that I got a special notification from the US EPA and the last administration. Uh, and they basically gave us a shout out. Growing seaweeds uh, in coastal waters can be a very positive benefit for the environment. Why? Because you're taking out carbon dioxide, you're taking out nutrients there, and so they gave us the best management shout out in the 2013 EPA report to the president. And that was very rewarding. But things started as we were producing information people can find and see the tangible benefits of that. So when we look at things, I, one of the problems that I had in Long Island Sound no one knew what to do with seaweed farming. Uh, we were told, you can't have more farms in Long Island Sound. So if they asked me why, I asked them why. We have no regulatory structure. And I said, regulatory structure? You're, you're regulating shellfish. Well, we have no regulatory structure. There's no governmental structure. Tell us in state statutes where to find it. And I said, well, there isn't any. So, they gave me a challenge. I sat down with friends in the UConn Law School, uh, UConn School of Business. Uh, we said, okay, we've got to make this apolitical. We've got to get two really uh, good students uh, as part of setting up a regulatory structure for the state of Connecticut. Now, what we've done in the state of Connecticut wasn't done in any of the New England states or any other state. So we set up a regulatory structure. We gave a home for seaweed farming. We put in the Bureau of Aquaculture, which is in the State Department of Agriculture here in Connecticut. Uh, they're still having problems figuring things out, but at least we had a central location. We had to do things. Uh, application for permits, uh, we were able to lay out a path for that as well. And working with the US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, they're involved in final review of structures in the water. So this set a, uh, a path for all the other New England states that are developing regulatory structures. Now, where have we gone? In 2008, 2009, we had one little company, had a couple of lines in the water, and that was it for the entire country. Uh, right now, when we look at production, depending on sites, uh, we have production that ranges anywhere from 13 to 24 kilos fresh weight per meter of line. So that's a lot of weight. 
and you can start generating numbers if you have a lot of lines in the water you can have very significant production this is how we started growing an in industry i my first company that i worked with was up in southern maine in the portland area then i brought it back to long island sound worked with a small company called thimble island oyster farm it eventually morphed into an organization you could just uh, check it out called green wave and uh, they're involved in rester of farming uh, now not only in the U.S., but globally. And so when we look at ecosystem services, it's important for the public to know that seaweed farming is extracting nutrients from the water. This is how much carbon is extracted per area. That's how much nitrogen. That's important. And you're not paying for it as a consumer. You're having improving water quality, and it's by supporting this type of aquaculture. Now, we had no farms uh, uh, with no one able to produce seed, and we started in my Yukon lab. I uh, went to a Petco, got a Queria, went to Home Depot, bought some PVC pipes. I took some lines, and we were able to put it around the PVC pipes, uh, and we set up our first nursery prototype. Eventually, that morphed into Atlantic Sea Farms nursery that uh, started producing a couple of kilometers of seed strain. Eventually, Green Wave in the Thimble Island area, uh, that's where their farms are, but uh, Green Wave is located in New Haven. We have an industrial nursery there that can produce 30 kilometers of seed strain for farmers. That's a point, that's a spin-off business. Uh, we have another company up in Alaska right now called Blue Evolution, also set them up, and they're producing this year alone over 80 kilometers of seed stream line. Uh, as you can see, we started with a very small quantity. Now we're starting to get at commodity levels of production, which is important. Uh, there's a picture of Brent Smith. Uh, he was the owner of the Thimble Island uh, oyster farm, who was going into bankruptcy after Hurricane Sandy. We rescued him. I liked it because uh, Brent listened to everything I said. He had no background in seaweed farming, but he listened, he read everything I gave him, and he was able to write very well. Uh, he was not just your typical average farmer in the sea, not only a kid who ran away from Hope and Newfoundland and to work in the Bering Sea, but he eventually got a degree in English and a JD degree from Cornell. And this is important because he integrated the information, able to communicate that very, very well uh, to the uh, public. And so, uh, when we look at kelp aquaculture in New England, it's eight years of growing. Just in New England alone, we have over 70 farms. These are farms that are just uh, maybe uh, oh, maybe a thousand uh, meters of line. Uh, some farms will be uh, 68 hectares of space, some of the bigger farms up in Maine. But we have a lot of different farms now. We have many nurseries throughout New England providing the seed of the, uh, the kelp. Uh, this is important too. What farmers ask me, what do we do with it? I said, go to a restaurant and work with a chef. And I did that quite a bit myself because I was curious. But uh, I also uh, basically saw something in Asia uh, a little processing machine that people cut up their squid, and I said, ah, oh, I can cut up the kelp. And we just uh, modified the instrument that I saw in Korea uh, as a kelp cutting device. And uh, for the developing industry, I decided, since it was being, my research was being supported by the USDA NIFA program, uh, the, uh, I felt I didn't take any IP. I thought it was best to let the industry uh, have the opportunity to produce a product. I like food products because they go in my mouth. They also give the opportunity for a farmer uh, to produce a high quality food that doesn't require fresh water, doesn't require nutrients, doesn't require fertilizer. Hey, it's a virtuous vegetable. And you can see right over here in Greenwich, if you go uh, to uh, 
Greenwich every June, the Greenwich Shellfish Commission uh, basically introduces the folks to Long Island Sound. And uh, somebody from my lab working with folks at the Watt Community College there, culinary arts program, introduced many different uh, kelp products uh, to the general public. And they're quite good. Uh, those individuals there besides the chef, those are my doctoral, my uh, postdoctoral students. I try to make sure that my students, as they're working with me in the lab, also interact with the general public. I think that's important. Makes their work relevant. And uh, most recently, now we're starting to gear up with larger quantities of production. So we're looking at animal feeds. Animal feeds that can go into fish feeds. Animal feeds that can go into feeding cows. And that's a big time industry. When you start going into animal feeds, then you have to reach a certain level of production. And we know that uh, cows like to eat certain types of seaweeds. Like I said before, go to Northern Europe, you go to Ireland, you go to Scotland, you go into Norway, or if you even go to the other side of the planet, go to New Zealand, uh, the grazing animals will feed on kelp in particular. So they're healthy. And so I've been working now with Penn State on a major project, also with the University of Pennsylvania, to uh, look at cultivated uh, seaweeds, not only kelp, other seaweeds as well, that we can produce in large quantities and put them into animal feeds. Now, the last thing I wanted to introduce you is to uh, new technologies being brought to you by the U.S. Department of Energy's RPE program. And this is the Mariner program. Uh, the Mariner program refers to macroalgae research inspiring novel energy resources. A $30 million investment that started during the Trump administration. Not bad. Uh, somebody must have gotten the idea that, hey, we could do something in U.S. coastal waters uh, that is really unique. When we take a look at U.S. coastal waters, we have something called the exclusive economic zone of the United States. Anywhere from three miles to 200 miles out, that belongs to the U.S. Uh, we look at the areas within the uh, three miles that belongs to the states and the states regulate that. But when we look at the exclusive economic zone of the United States, we're dealing at more than 11.7 million square kilometers of space. That far exceeds our land mass of the United States, which is only 10.5, I'm sorry, 9.5 uh, million square kilometers. And if you can use that exclusive economic zone for growing and farming uh, different types of seaweeds, uh, this is a new opportunity for the U.S. And that's what uh, the Mariner program is. The Mariner program is trying to give the tools to farmers that you can use for production aquaculture of seaweeds. Initially, it's going to support the culinary, the food industry in the United States. As more food production is going on, then you'll be able to move it into the commodity market of animal feeds and ultimately looking at biofuels. And that's what Marin is doing. Uh, no land, no fresh water, no fertilizer. Tell me, how does land-based agriculture uh, compare with that? And so when we look at this, the question is, can we get the biomass cost competitive to potentially produce it at a value of $80 a dry metric ton? If we do, we're able to uh, convert that biomass, which is principally carbohydrate, into biofuel. And that's why RPE is interested. RPE is interested not so much for today, but they're looking at tomorrow for the biofuel application. And this graph, I think, sum, uh, uh, sums it up. As we're going on the pa path to biofuels there, we're gonna develop new tools. And these tools will be able to increase food production, hydrocolloids that come from seaweeds, eventually animal feeds, and then eventually biofuels. And uh, I've been fortunate, in a sense, be one of the labs 
main layers for developing new tools there. Uh, you know, when we look at the value of the seaweeds, you can see it. Uh, the lowest values are down in the commodity markets uh, right there. Uh, but large biomass, you can produce that. Uh, human food, you get a much higher value. Uh, stop looking at nutraceuticals uh, from seaweeds. That should tell you something where things can go. And if you look at farm in the pharmacological area, drugs and so forth, look at the value right there. And that's in existing products today. And these are uh, nice opportunities, especially for people who are, you know, attorneys. You know, when you look at patents, there are a lot of IP that's being generated uh, in those upper value areas there. So, developing scalable is really important. Uh, RPE. RPE has supported scalable production, especially in areas uh, of New England, areas of the coastal zone in the Gulf of Alaska, also any other places in the exclusive economic zone. Working with the National Ocean Service, we develop an app that you can put on your, tele on your phone. And this app is a scalability app. It can, you put a point any place in the U.S. exclusive economic zone, and we can tell you uh, if, if that's a good investment or not for growing uh, certain types of seaweeds. Now, whether it's East Coast, West Coast, in tropical areas, and if you look right over in Alaska, within 50 kilometers of any Alaskan point, a uh, port is over three and a half million hectares potentially available for growing kelp. And if you look in New England, we have over a million hectares uh, there, potentially growing kelp. Why is this important? What is this uh, suitability index based on? Of 155 data layers, these data, data layers also include military data layers, which makes it even better for business. It really shows you when you get this uh, app how powerful it is. And so uh, this is where uh, RPE has made a lot of investment and with the uh, selective breeding tools uh, that I've been working with at my labs at Whistle Oceanographic Institute and our other partners, I felt it was important to bring in terrestrial agricultural experts. And what find a place to bring in colleagues from Cornell University. They are the lead university globally in terrestrial agriculture. So we're, we thought of one, a marriage, bringing those techniques and those scientists along there, and we have now developing farming techniques. We virus isolated germplasm from the New England region. We also have done it for the West Coast. We do collections of the water. We bring it back to the laboratory, and then we isolate uh, strains from all these different sites. Uh, the, the pictures that you see, all sugar kelp. Ones that can be strap-like in the far left-hand corner, ones that are very broad. That's a lot of genetic diversity that we see. And we've captured that in the germplasm collection uh, or the seed bank that we have at UConn for our breeding program. And like any breeding program, I don't have a backyard, I don't have a terrestrial place where I could do this, so we have to work with a breeding program in the sea. Uh, we have a, a, a common garden in the Thimble Islands, one up in the Gulf of Maine, uh, right off Portsmouth, uh, New Hampshire, and we're able to put out the, the fine strains that we have done the crossings uh, for. And this hasn't been done any place in the world uh, until our project started doing this as part of our RPE program. And we even have a place at Woods Hole uh, water control to a raceway where we can grow certain strains all during the year. And so that's a farm design that we put out. We don't work with single lines anymore. We work with multiple lines. Uh, that's a module. We have this module now replicated in the Gulf of Alaska uh, 30 times in one farm that uh, expands over a large area and we're starting to produce uh, large quantities of the kelp and we know the genetic lineage of the kelp. Uh, when we look at farming on land, 
productive. You know, we have spent over hundreds of years growing crops. And this is our first year plant diversity. We grow uh, the, the kelp from different genetic strains in these uh, one meter plots there. We harvested it after four months and we did that last year. And we look at each plot for the dry weight. We look at what kind of production we have. And we've done this now uh, for our top growing strains as well as the ones that are poor performers. But this is agriculture of the future in the seaweed farming area. Where does it go? And this is where you, in the areas of you know, computer technology areas of IP, uh, this is a seaweed biorefinery. And there's many opportunities now for getting that IP, which I decided that you know, it would be best to develop the industry in the area of cultivation so we can get to these different product development. I have to say, a lot of the work that you've just seen has been supported over the years by a lot of different federal agencies, state agencies as well. And, uh, but the current work today is being supported by the RPE program of the Department of Energy. And this has been an amazing investment. Other countries are trying to emulate this or even join our research teams that we have in the US. We're starting late compared to other areas of aquaculture, but what we've done in the last two or three years, uh, it's taken decades of other countries to do. We are also doing the genome work. So you heard about the Human Genome product Project? We're doing that for the, the, the uh, kelp species that we're working with. So we'll have an understanding of what's going on in the DNA for crop enhancement as well. We're using new tools for gene editing in the laboratory so we can potentially expand to the newest tools available in molecular biology, all being supported by the RPE program. Thank you. Problems that lobsters have to deal with 
Uh, they deal with climate change by migrating north. The seaweed populations may be migrating north. Uh, however, we have the germplasm that was there, so we can deal with that. And then uh, we are working with certain tropical seaweeds that are starting to move northward, and uh, that's another project that I'm working with. Uh, colleagues at the Marine Biology Laboratory uh, and also the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. We've identified a particular seaweed native to the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico that as it moves northward, we have potential of growing this in large scale production on the same infrastructure that you saw the pictures of the farm system. And uh, that will be done very nicely. I've just spent uh, the springtime uh, over in North Carolina working with coastal regulators, showing them the opportunities for that particular seaweed in, in part uh, for uh, the southern, southeastern part of the U.S. So there are seaweeds that will migrate into an area, out of an area. We can deal with climate change because we have our own seed in, all, uh, in industrial companies that we plan to spin off. We haven't been able to do that with lobsters. Yes. My question is similar along the lines of the first question. I eat seaweed. I love seaweed. In fact, I had seaweed snacks for lunch today. I sprinkled dulce on top of my salads. Since these do take in a lot of things, I know you said it's selective. If you're in highly polluted waters or something like that, I understand the pros of cleaning those waters and all that. What does that do for humans ingesting it? Does it take in any of those toxins? You question, what about a seaweed taking up certain pollutants from the sea, uh, where it grows? That's a real good question. Uh, obviously, what we call pollution in this region principally is nutrient pollution. To me, that's fertilizer. Uh, and it's available and it's free. Seaweeds will be able to take it up and respond to it. Uh, are you going to put your seaweed farm in the mouth of uh, uh, New Bedford Harbor? Absolutely not, because the seaweeds you put in there are going to be exposed to industrial pollutants that can be taken up by seaweeds. Where seaweeds are grown reflect the environment. You have to know where it's growing. You have to know where it comes from. Why will U.S. production go over to Asia as we satisfy the American market? Because Asians know that their waters are polluted not only with nutrients, but all the people, they're also polluted with industrial chemicals. The arsenics, the cadmium, the lead, the mercury. You have to know where, what's in there. And don't expect your USDA and your FDA to know what's in all your products. They don't. I just spent a day working with FDA trying to explain to them what they should be paying attention to for American consumers. My, my hypothesis is once global uh, consumers know what's in U.S. products, we have the competitive edge with our farm goods in the sea, just like we have the competitive edge with our terrestrial agriculture. Uh, and that's something that you can't replicate in Asian coastal waters, anywhere from uh, Japan all the way down to the Chinese coast uh, where they are also growing seaweeds in large quantities. It's really a story about where it's grown. Yes? Uh, where, so you said the coast, but are you going further than the coast? The we're water? going out, we're developing the aquaculture systems that can withstand what the North Atlantic can throw at us. Our farm systems are being designed to withstand uh, the North Atlantic in the dead of winter. That means uh, 60 to 75 foot waves. And these uh, farm systems that we are developing, uh, they are being modeled by different, uh, the U.S. Navy as well, as well as other uh, modeling teams that are working with us there. And that's the robustness of our structures. And that's really important because that's where we can see we can have levels of production that can rival levels of production uh, from Asia. So, yeah. one more question. Are, are you reintroducing these the seaweed back into the coastal waters? Or? We, our, our systems can be used in coastal near shore waters within the three mile limit. It's up to each state to develop their own permitting, but we 
gone through that in every New England state. Uh, the opportunity in offshore waters, uh, with you, anytime you go three miles off the coast, uh, are much greater. There's a lot of space there. God bless you. The Suitability Act, uh, Atlas that the National Ocean Service uh, has developed is really uh, a phenomenal tool. So as we are, say, planting wind farms off the New England coast, you probably have seen information on that, uh, we know where those wind farms are, and we can then uh, cite, using our suitability tool, how much of that area can actually be used for also farming. Yes. First of all, congratulations. A lot of hard work and um, amazing trajectory. So sincere congratulations. Um, three points. Number one, since the stock markets, the commodity markets have indices and trade, can one trade on kelp prices? Number two, uh, I have a bit one concern, and that's the line. I served in the Air Force on a sailboat. They said to me, now you're useless. Just watch for the lobster cages. Make sure we don't get tangled into the engine, whatever. So what about that line aesthetically? And then the third point, once you harvest, do you need to process it while it's still wet? Or how do you kind of, how much processing time? OK, uh, the processing time could be quite rapid. Uh, we have one team actually developing uh, a tugboat to uh, harvest the lines and move the lines, uh, the product into barges. And RBE just wants us to be able to get the production costs getting it to a barge because that can then be converted into a uh, polyethylene, it can be converted, uh, converted into a biobutanol as well as ethanol. So that is something that's being looked at. Uh, you asked about the log lines. Well, we're working with log lines uh, that are being modeled. They, we know the tensile strength of that long line. Uh, the long lines that we are working in the offshore environment have to withstand 75 foot waves. We know that uh, the US Navy has been very gracious and telling us a lot about the physical oceanography where their ship traffic is as well. So we are paying attention to that. Uh, I'm also working uh, most recently with a company some of you have heard called Gore-Tex. They all of a sudden got it. They say a good opportunity for developing new fabrics, new lines for structures for growing different types of seaweeds, especially the kelp. And so we're paying attention to each of the items that uh, you mentioned because we have to. I mean, you can't put a system in that's going to go end up like a ghost pot, uh, a lobster pot that is broken away from its, uh, its mooring system. So we need to do the right modeling. And again, we're working with some phenomenal modeling teams from the US Navy, the Annapolis uh, uh, folks there, physical oceanographers, as well as physical oceanographers from uh, different government labs in the Pacific Northwest. Commodity pricing? Uh, commodity pricing, you know something? As soon as we get uh, enough farms to get at that commodity level, it will have to go into commodity pricing. It has to. And but we're not anywhere near the level of production. Uh, right now, the, uh, the market coming out of Asia is being dominated by several Chinese companies, lesser extent of the uh, Korean companies, but they're government controlled pricing. Once we have our markets here, they'll have to go onto the commodity market. Thank you. And we have to be prepared for that as well. That's competitive business. Yeah. Would it ever make economic sense to vertically farm kill on land? Uh, on land, no. Uh, I have colleagues who tried that in Hawaii where they brought up deep ocean seawater that's very cold. Uh, they sold a bill of goods to in the 1980s to the Department of Energy. I didn't think it was going to cut it. And a lot of these of dollars of investment disappeared. The same group tried to also introduce it to the Caribbean. Uh, you got a lot of uh, deep cold water there, bringing it up to the surface, uh, converting it into some, you know, get some fresh water out of it. It just doesn't work that way right there. You just can't grow uh, a, a seaweed that is big as a kelp in tank systems on land. However, some of the other algae that we're, we are working with, 
some of the red algae and green algae, yes, they can be grown on land. Uh, Blue Evolution has an experimental farm, and actually it's a production farm, just south of Ensenada, Mexico, in the Baja Peninsula. Uh, they have a 12 hectare parcel there. Uh, they've got multiple raceways now producing a green seaweed, sea lettuce, all grown for the ingredient market. It makes economic sense for them to do it on that product for the ingredient market. Other red seaweeds that have uh, interesting biochemical profiles are being grown now in different parts of the world. One area is the Iberian Peninsula by two of my former doctoral students who realize you can't get into a university uh, in every country uh, to spend your career. And I encourage them to develop their passion and they develop production systems in lagoons and on land. But they're producing high value products that are in that cosmetic industry going up into the drug industry. So it makes economic sense. Five years ago, you talked about the use of kelp or uh, Hunts Point to, uh, when it was harvested, to extract heavy metals, and that was a really interesting economic uh, model. What happened to that? It got published this year, in 2017, and we were one of the first papers produced in the U.S. that shows you what the capacity would be of growing kelp in areas that have industrial pollutants there and what was very interesting for us is that we compared the regulatory framework of the united states and if i didn't tell you it was in the east river we compared the regulatory framework of what we found in the kelp we met the u.s standards the epa standards the USDA standards for a seafood product growing out of the East River, including the mercury standard that blew me away. Uh, we, as we went into Long Island Sound going eastward, we had uh, even lower levels there. But we discussed that in a, in a, a paper, uh, seafood safety, because we have to know what's in our products. That's why I said every site is different. You have to know what's in the product. Is it a way of mitigating uh, issues in the areas? Well, you have to get the right seaweeds. But for what we found, uh, for our growing season, which was in the East River only six months, you know, we put out microscopic material, and then six months later, we harvest. Uh, but uh, they didn't pick up as much as we would have expected. So there, the economics turned out not to be the same. We didn't look we at the economics. We didn't look at the economics, but it's sitting there in the peer-reviewed published literature for somebody wanting to do the economic analysis. All right, please join me in. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. Thank you all for coming. Uh, third Tuesday of the month. Uh, next month we have unmanned uh, aerial vehicles. And we're also using autonomous vehicles in our systems. In the offshore environment, we have a group out of Woods Hole uh, that are working with us so they can position our rigs and instead of putting divers in the water in the offshore in the winter, we have autonomous vehicles going in. But nothing on Mars yet. <laughs> no, not enough seawater. Nothing he can talk about. <laughs>